We're on. We are in the Pitch Media Asia studio here in Singapore. My name's Graham Brown, joined by Sam Gibb. Sam, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me again, Graham. It's good to have you here. You're looking well. You're looking like slim down and lean and keen. What's the story? Yeah, yeah apparently. Uh, we've just you know, been spending a bit of time at the gym and then kind of focused, focused on endeavor and as a result of that i've i guess i've been skipping a few meals and yeah just been slowing down a bit I, mean, yeah. you look, I think you're looking well you're looking good yeah. vibrant vibrant Glowing, i think you have yeah. to be vibrant i mean you, you are the, the public face of the vc world many people might know you as an angel investor but you also have an early stage fund endeavor which you've been busy setting up and uh you know the purpose of this show today is to really put a face to people from that world as well and maybe give a bit of advice to startup founders so you know we're going to try some new things today so we're going to try new formats for investors and and do appreciate you coming on and taking a bit of a risk with the format as well sam so you know none of this is rehearsed by the way everybody so what sam's going to do in the next 40 minutes is completely unrehearsed it's raw and authentic you feel game for it yeah i'm fired up let's do it <laughs> all right okay so to get us started to get us into the groove i've got a bit of a, a quick fire round you cool with that i'm going to yep. ask you some rapid questions which yeah, are unrehearsed unrehearsed you haven't seen any of these questions before right and i want to try and because i think the key here is that angel investors early stage vcs have a very human face and we want to get that out we want to sort of build that brand a little bit in the community so startups can understand who they are and what they are and how they think and so on. So Sam Gibb, are you ready? Yeah, hit let's me with do it. it. Go. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a rapid fire question. If you you know, waffle on, I'm gonna cut you off. Okay? So be clear and precise. I know you're a man who have very few words sometimes. You like to give it direct. The Simon Cowell of the startup community. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, let's do it. Explain your industry to a five year old. This isn't very quick now, is it? It's a it's deep answer. <laughs> <laughs> what does a VC Basically, do? Yeah, backing backing ideas. What does yeah. that mean, Daddy? What's a, what's a, what's an idea? What's backing mean? Helping great people do great things. Superb. I like that. Are you a coffee drinker? No. You don't drink any? Nah, nah. It just messes with me too much. I am too sensitive to it, so I have a coffee. Well, any, Anytime around midday, and I'm up for the, the rest of the night. I'm it's like just, that. Twelve yeah. o'clock's the cutoff. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be that, like I mean, everybody in the startup world drinks like crazy amounts of coffee, don't they? Yeah. So I ended up cutting it out. I'll go with a tea every now and then, but yeah, too much caffeine's just it just doesn't sit well. You're quite mellow when it comes I'm, to caffeine. I think I'm highly enough strung anyway. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now you you're you've got a, a daughter, right? Yeah. How old is she? Just had her first first birthday, yeah. Fantastic. What has she taught you? Probably that... Actually, recently, so on the weekend, as I was scared because I just asked her, do you want to go for a swim? I don't know if she knew what I was talking about or not. She nods. Yep. And where about your togs? Boom! Points out the window to the to the chair where her, her togs are hanging out drying. I was like, Jesus Christ! She can understand absolutely everything we're saying now. So that that part of me was scared. And what I think, in what way that you might say too much or? Oh, she's gonna swear like a sailor. But <laughs> That's what I'm worried about this podcast. <laughs> no, you she, have a you have history, by the way, when yeah. it comes to swearing on podcasts. Yeah, but she's. Between, and also just the nature versus nurture thing. The, the thing I, I've noticed the most about her is she had such a strong personality from the start. Mm. And that's only grown stronger over time. I don't, from what I've heard when I've talked to other people who've had multiple children, is there's definitely a massive nature element in it. And that there's, there's some inherent qualities in people's uh, personalities. Uh, and I, I, I think that's true. Maybe in applying that into the, the startup world then, maybe sometimes leopard you know they can't change their spots yeah so depending on who you're working with it it's yeah it's, it's really important getting the right people does it change like how you deal with people i mean i've got a boy he's yeah. 13 now and i think 
after having him changed a lot about how I dealt with people. I was a lot more, I was a sort of like trying to be the super successful CEO building a big company, you know, like a big sort of army of workers under me. And after I had him, it was like, I'm less interested in those things. I just want to do stuff that I really care about now. I think, I don't know if that yeah. was just age anyway. Yeah, but. no, but this is, there's, there's two things that I've seen consistently, like listening to, you know, Ferris, or reading his books, whatever, mm. f through various interviews with different people. It's, and those two things are, well, one, no one, no one's ever died and said, I wish I didn't spend more time with family, right? Yeah. Like, so you, you're always better off spending more time with family. That's, that's one thing I truly believe. And the other thing is, every, you know, whenever anyone's asked, what would you tell yourself from if if you could go back ten years and talk to yourself? What would you tell yourself? And it's like, don't worry, things will turn out alright. Yeah. That's 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 consistent across like everyone that I've seen. So it's something that's kind of sat with me too because yeah, I'm massively impatient generally mm. and want to push, you know, willing to put in the work, do do whatever is required because I'm frustrated that I'm not where I want to be and this this kind of goes to like process versus outcome goals as well but largely it's just caused me to think about yeah just just trusting the process so mm. there's a the family element and absolutely just yeah yeah I mean it makes me think hard about those kind of things is that you know it, it, like taking risks as well that you're not going to die as a result of this in many of these decisions right it will work out okay if you have the sort yeah. of the basic skills you'll find you, you take a few blows yeah, well, but you'll bounce back, right? And this is this is Amazon's whole thing too, right? Like, if it's a two-way door, go for it. Or if the the cost is going to be incremental, then sure, go, you, you, you go for it. You've got to take chances. I think too many people don't take chances because they look at so many things in life as like a one-way door when it's yeah. not. It's yeah. it's two ways. And if you if you can understand that, then yeah, you can you can give a heap more things a crack and lead a more fulfilling life. Good. Here, yeah, here, yeah. we're getting mm -hmm. philosophical. In the first I'm five minutes, I'm going deep in this. It's rapid going deep. Fire. No, it's, I love it's it. It's not even that rapid fire. I mean, no, come on, you've got to hit, hit me with them. <laughs> but I thought we got to indulge a little bit. Do you yeah. read a lot? Yeah, heaps. What was the last book you read that you can remember? Oh, hatching Twitter. I finished Hatching Twitter on the weekend. I hadn't, I hadn't really delved down into. Who wrote that? The, I don't know. It's funny, isn't it? You read these books and you forget who it writes them. Ken, Kindle, so I don't even look at oh, the yeah, author exactly. every time I yeah. pick it up. Yeah. Um, what was a book that really made an impact on you recently? Are you always reading business books? No. Book that made an impact on me. Did you I read, read uh, Tim Ferriss' latest one? Nah, it's too, it's too long. Of Men he didn't, Five he didn't, or whatever. He, he, I, I don't feel like he really edited, edited it or, yeah. or broke it down. And then also you've got the co correlation versus causation argument. Like, are these people, you know, is their morning habit, does that actually make a difference or not? Or do they just have a morning habit? Uh, yeah. ha has their morning habit evolved because they have become successful and they actually have the time to spend with family? Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I don't know if I, you know, are, are you going to be Mark Wahlberg getting up at 3 a.m., go play around a golf and, and do that? Yeah. Is that going to make you more successful? Or is that something that he's allowed to indulge in because he's got to that level? I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe in that so much. So, so I read. I just dip in and out of a heap of different books. Mm. Um, Atomic Habits is all right, but that was kind of just going over things. That do do you before. read anything particularly about this region in Asia, like AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee? I got that do you like on it? the weekend. I haven't actually gotten to that yet. Uh, I've, been st I've started that. I mean, yeah. it, just in terms of case studies, it's phenomenal. I mean, going into sort of the early stages of China internet and like the kind of ruthlessness of the competition like in 2010, you know, everybody says that the, these are sort of like the products of protectionist markets. Th these are like, you know, gladiator, he calls them like gladiatorial arenas where, you know, you put in 5,000 clones and the best one emerges out of that, you know, and then ready to do battle mm. on the international scale. So it's, that's always going to be better if you've got the competition there, right? Because then everyone's going to try and fight it out. And it's, I guess that's what the, what Singapore's trying to do now with the ecosystem generally is trying to just encourage more startups yeah. to be here even if some of those guys are doing the same things but it's like it's, it is the turtle approach right the jungle yeah the rule of jungle um what do people misunderstand most about vcs excluding what vcs think about each other what do you think when if you tell people you're a vc do you tend to get any sort of common misunderstandings about what you do i 
I think the biggest problem is in understanding that different different guys have different focus areas, and a lot of a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs will just approach anyone and think that that capital is as good as this other person's capital or whatever. Mm and that there's no difference between the VCs, no difference between stages, and given it's very early in Asia. So we haven't really had that kind of uh, differentiation. The the segmentation start to evolve, and, and like that's starting to happen though. So we know a guy who's doing a hospitality tourism VC, there's, there's a couple of FinTech VCs here, um, but it's not like there's SaaS or there's consumer tech vcs is it's whereas the the market's just far deeper and in, in other developed markets i think yeah i think the biggest issue is people not really understanding how each of the different funds are positioned right do, so, do they have to be vertical specific because i know you don't focus on a particular vertical you're more geographic or stage aren't you and yeah is is that a deliberate play because will that over time have to become vertical specific well ideally i would like to have been a bit more specific in the verticals that i tackled uh but because there just aren't enough opportunities right. here, which is why why there isn't that focus uh, in the in the industry here. Mm, mm, yeah, but in time, yeah, a bit more deal flow, a bit more volume. I think we'll get there, won't we? I mean, if we're gonna, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how it is if you look compare like for like, say, with Silicon Valley. You know, whether they, everybody has a, a sector there, or you have people say, "I'm just going to focus on this round." on this type of startup, whether they're health tech or whether they're travel and tourism, for example. Yeah, the reason I'm thinking about it, though, because I'm like, I don't know how deep the industries can actually be and if whether or not it can actually support that many different verticals here because you've got to think that for each of these companies or each of the verticals to be successful, then you have to have a sufficient number of customers there. And so maybe it, maybe it ends up making more sense to having more international VCs because, mm. this is, and this is a trend that we've been seeing lately, is... A lot of the guys over in the US are getting sick of paying up for the valuations. They can get into you know, similar stage companies over here, or they can actually be further along in the process for a far cheaper valuation because that valuation is typically going to be driven by the cost of living at the end of the day, right? If if it's really expensive for your engineers to live, then you're going to have to pay them a higher wage, and that's going to determine how much the company has to raise at the the earlier stages. So maybe maybe we end up seeing yeah more more geographic spread between more six specialized VCs. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, talking of valuations, let's talk about Lau. Oh, yeah. Do you want to go there? Yeah, I mean, sure, Like yeah. that conversation about Lau, we're having a really interesting conversation off topic. I hear on reasonable authority that at one point you were an investor in every equity on the, the Lau stock exchange. True or yeah, false? Yeah, this is true. There were two. <laughs> there were two, yeah. How, how, do, how do you achieve that? sort of moniker of you, you were like the whale of Lao you were the I don't know if I would have classified myself as the whale of Lao but I <laughs> how did it happen actually it was it was it was quite a funny story behind this too because w one time I had some friends that were traveling through Asia and they you know were going by Vietnam up to Laos so I went up to Lao I met them I decided that I wanted to get involved with a bit more emerging market equities uh Lao stock exchange looked reasonable at the time, there was, there was a bank and a hydroelectric company, one of which was paying a, you know, like a 15% dividend yield and the other one was trading like four times earnings. So I was like, this is, this is, this is super interesting. Uh, we'd had a big night out. And then the next day, I jumped in a Tuk Tuk and I went to the exchange to open up the account. So like, you know, talking to the brokers and da da da, da And I had, to have, I, had, I had a deposit, I remember, I had to deposit 10 US dollars but then 10. also your 10 US dollars to open the account. It was, I was like, really? Is that it? Okay, sure. And then it actually took another two or three months to get the account open after that because I'd stuffed up some of the paperwork, even though I'd done it, filled it out in front of them. And they, you know, it was just, just the back and forth of that paperwork. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, bas it basically went nowhere, that, that investment. One went, one doubled, the other halved, and I was just... Like okay, a good experience I'll, though. Are you yeah. were you influenced in any way by Jim Rogers, like investment by? Yeah, massively actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting. I opened up an account in Sri Lanka. I got one in. What is it? Yeah, Iran. Like this. Uh, it's just very hard to be able to do the research and take the risk. And what is it about that? I mean, what, you know, for example, like investing in Laos. You know, just I'm sure for you it was there's a lot of sort of 
factors why you were doing it. You were just it, there's a bit of an excitement, maybe an adventure as well. Obviously the return. But I think about like with Jim Rogers, an investment biker, he was into the emerging markets before people really started talking about it. He was in China before China was yeah. a thing, right? And even like Eastern Europe and the old Russia and so on. You know, that sort of attitude that going there, not just sort of doing it remotely from behind a desk, actually going to these places, you know, looking at what people are yeah. doing and so on. What was it for you? What were the drivers? Oh, that's that's what I like the most. That's what I like the most about uh, the, the hedge fund world previously was actually going there, talking to companies, like seeing what the landscape's like. That's, that's what I really enjoyed, like actually getting my hands dirty. And I remember one of my mentors back in New Zealand, we went to, we went to see a company and we, the, the CEO had given us a tour around. We go into the boardroom, big cushy seats and da, 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 da. And we're talking, we're kind of going over the financials and all this kind of stuff. We walk out and the guy goes to me, he goes, do you see that? Oh, what, what, what are you talking about? He, goes, he didn't say hi to any of the employees. I was like, oh yeah. So like, nah, like, nah, leave it alone. Like it's kind of reading between the lines, doesn't have a great relationship. Mm. Uh, and also just the way that the the place was laid out it was it was more about like show status ego and less about actually getting the job done and it, that, it actually kind of came to pass so yeah I, I yeah i always like to get involved and meet the people and and yeah be on the ground as much as possible you still so, do that with your startups as well don't yeah you? and this is this is the this is the reason i'm doing that now and in, in the startup space and then also being more focused here too because this is what i can do hmm with the fund i don't think i'd be able to service a larger geography uh with with the fund of this size at this but there's a space isn't there there's a gap in the market and since we you know we chatted a lot about this about the startup ecosystem here in singapore and asia and there are a lot of people in the angel space and a there's not enough that can do multiple rounds but b there's not enough people who can actually add real value in the sense that they want to get involved. People are almost like investing in as they would in a market, right? You know, yeah. it's kind of sort of hands off. Whereas, you know, when you came here last time, I was surprised to learn that you look at every single pitch deck that somebody emails you, right? Yeah, I even watched some of the um, videos too, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you but that you have to have, I mean, it reminds me, you know, like meeting Tony Fernandez the other day. He, he just like likes that. He doesn't do it because he's, like somehow following a strategy which says, oh, you have to go back to the shop floor. You know, he likes going to Newton Hawker Center and eating with people, you know, the locals. Yeah. He, he likes that because that's like his vibe. Well, right? I think this is what, you, like if you're, if you're doing this and if you're trying to do it in a meaningful way, then you have to like that. You have to be predisposed to that, those kind of activities because otherwise, what are you in it for? If you just want to make money, sure, like focus on your corporate gig, try to try to get ahead that way or go and invest in the equity markets because if you were to invest in like the, kind of the top tech names of the last five years you would have got like as, as i said before you know yeah. kind of four four or five times your money out of, of five years that's a top quarter return for some of the vc funds so if you're if you're if you're in this for the money i think you you're probably in it for the wrong reasons if you if you're in it to actually help people give back and you're, you're genuinely curious like if you if you've actually spent the time in your career and you always want to take the entrepreneurial risk but you never had the opportunity to maybe it's because of family reasons timing reasons whatever and then you now you you you, you kind of can but it's not say it's not worth it for you you might just want to get involved in actually helping other people take that risk too mm. and live vicariously through them yeah as well and i think that's that's going to be far more rewarding for people you know it's i i look at it more as being about like the service uh, as opposed to being about it looking at it like a zero-sum game I and mean, that's why i didn't really like the, the hedge fund side of things so much because i knew it was always a zero-sum game do you think that that's sort of a you know a, a minority viewpoint in the world of venture capital Le let's say the angels who tend to be more like that or want to be more like that i don't know if it's a, a minority view because i think and it's just a different industry in that you're going to have multiple people that are going into a round so that aspect of it isn't going to be zero-sum um yeah, some people are getting kicked out and others mm. in. Yeah, then it is. But I, I don't think that's the that's the general vibe. But also, it's because of the personality that you have to have. You have to be more optimistic and think that things are actually going to go well to want to get involved in the industry. Yeah. So you, 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 you're going to be less of that kind of zero-sum mindset. I mean, you know, an entrepreneur is trying to create value from nothing uh, or create markets that didn't exist before. So that 
in itself says that it's you know you're not trying to invest in zero sum things yeah i was reading um jason calacanis was talking about um you know like his sort of routine is that when he sits with a startup and he hears their pitch and he he'll say he'll write down okay so what could go wrong here okay so the founder doesn't have enough experience you know the market could dry up and so on and then he'll say like he'll rip up the piece of paper and start again and say what could go right and yeah. that sort of attitude i mean obviously i mean time will tell but he's probably one of the most successful investors in his category in especially in the u.s right so but that sort of mindset you're having to deal with people who are optimistic and saying all right okay the numbers aren't all here yet i see what that person can do and in a way you can only really get that if you're investing in people rather than spreadsheets as well, right? Yeah. And you I'd have to have that sort of frontline touching points with people as well, right? Yeah, I'd love to say that there's like a, a formula that you could overlay and just say, ah, oh, no, we can look at the quantitative data and we can we can understand what works, what doesn't work. Or these guys are going to do way better than these other guys. But I, I don't know. I think there's just like a massive touch and feel element at the end of the day. And I like personally, I'd like to get away from that as much as possible to, to be able to uh, institutionalize a process around it and to a to degree like that's what google ventures has done but i i still think at the early stage there's there's that massive of personal element because even if if you're investing in the right kind of people even if they come up against some really difficult hurdles they're going to be able to find a way to get around them and, yeah. and they're going to have that resilience to stick through it and that's probably something that you can only know from spending time with them getting to know them because mm. you like to get in early before you pull the trigger you're in on yeah, average how many them, months yeah. do you think it's always like two to three, right? At least, yeah. A deliberate do you, in that time, do you 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 quite hands on? Are you actively meeting them, having coffees, or how, how does that actually work? I mean, you you want to get to know them and their business, right, and their why and all that stuff. How, how does that actually? Is it sort of quite informal that process? It de depends how the approach has been. Yeah. So some sometimes there'll be people who, are, who will just approach me and they'll want some help, advice. I don't mind giving a bit of time away and, and talking to people. Um, when I have the time to give. Um, and so might build up a relationship that way. Others I might seek out or we've been introduced through... A, the, the approach has been more of a formal approach and that, okay, I'm definitely looking at this as an investment and then kind of just go back and forth doing like doing the due diligence asking questions about the business going over the model thinking through the issues that they're facing um solutions because it, it's it's really difficult and this is something that i always say to the startups that i meet especially the guys that i don't end up investing in is i, I always think it's worthwhile having a newsletter so even if the investor doesn't want to invest with you at the moment then at mm. least they they can actually build up a, a narrative they can build up a, a storyline as opposed to having dots because it's super hard when a startup goes to you hey we want this much cash and we've done this we're going to do this it's like okay but like how'd you get there a lot of the times there was a pivot something changed like it's it's really useful to know if you've been through the journey and i don't think it's that difficult to write you know just kind of nine bullet points out basically you know this is what we this is what we're working on this is what what worked this is what didn't work this is what we're going to be working on this is what we want help with like y you get those kind of points down and it's it's pretty easy and i think it's super useful yeah and not enough people do it yeah uh, because it's almost like you're investing in the investors long term as well in that relationship aren't you and to think okay well I, uh, there's a lot of pressure to close a deal or close a round so you're just focusing on the ones that look optimistic and here right now Yet the ones who are maybes might just be timing. It might just be that it's not all lined up for them yet. But like you say, it might be six months, 12 months down the line. Yeah. But there's one thing I like to be pretty firm on too. Like, okay, if it's, if there's a reason that I'm not in it, it's because of this. And okay, sometimes that comes back and kicks you because then they're like, okay, we hit that now. And now what? Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. Um, well, it's, but then it's like, it's pretty simple because if you honestly meant that, then it's like, okay, well, they've ticked the boxes. We can go forward. Yeah. And given maybe there's some other things that happen at other gates through the due diligence process but i think you, you, as an investor i think you owe it to the, the entrepreneurs to be honest about the reasons that you're stepping out mm. i like it okay let's uh change gears a little bit here i'm gonna put sam on the spot and by the way 
I mean, just so you know, none of this is rehearsed and he doesn't have any prior knowledge of the seven startups that we're going to talk about now. Maybe, though, I don't know. You might know who they are. So if you do, put in the disclaimers, yeah. right? Because, I mean, you do, you've probably seen every pitch deck that's out there, I think. You do get a lot of volume come your way, um, but not all of them. So I want to start with a little bit of fun first. I'm going to present you with their names and I want you to guess from their names what you think they do. And you, if you have no prior knowledge... It's a little bit unfair, yeah. but then life's unfair. So are you ready? Yep. Okay. I'm going to give you a startup name. You, if you've heard of them before, then I'd like to hear your answer as okay, well. Yeah, so yeah. if it's stuck with you, all right? You think, oh yeah, those guys, I might have met them. Okay. Are you ready? One, biorhythm. What do you think they do? Oh, it's be something monitoring the, monitoring your heart, probably using IoT devices. Very good. Excellent. Reset. Maybe it's like a mindfulness thing. I don't know. No, nah, I haven't. I don't Do you know who these people are? Nah. It's bloody good. Maybe it's just good name choices. Well, there you go. I mean, these are real startups. You got them, both of them spot on. Wicker Media. W-I-K-A Media. Something like an informational, maybe it's like informational videos. They prevent, prevent. Okay. I don't know. No. I'm going to tag them anyway. Let's yeah. see what they think. Absolute. Like the vodka, but with an E, as it should be spelled. Oh, I think I have seen this one. I can't remember. No, I can't remember. This is a really interesting in branding exercise, right? Because you've seen a lot and just how memorable these are. Absolute technologies. All right, next one. No, other than data science, I got nothing. I got nothing. S.A. Jack. Like, like S.A. A? No, S A as in Oh S A, right. Yeah, S A Jack. Someone who writes your school assignments for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty good. Be inclusive. Be inclusive. That's a, something in the social media space. Yeah. Okay, that was a good guess. I mean, that was a, a good go-to guess. Not nearly close enough. All right, last one, Panalit. Panalit. Pan, Pan, like, uh, Panalit. Film, something to do with film or... You yeah, kept, kept photo... Oh, yeah, that's... A, <laughs> <I got nothing. laughs> that's Panasonic, isn't it? Um, yeah. All right, very interesting. I thought that was a very good exercise because you, you see a lot of startups on a regular basis and just see how... I mean, obviously, not everything's dependent on the name, but just are they memorable? Does it fit in a box? And obviously, does it create imagery in your head? Man, that was a flame out. I thought I started well. You did, you did actually. I don't know if we put the easy ones up front, but um, we'll we'll tag them and see what they think. This is what an investor thinks of your name. <laughs> All right, so what I want to do now, now that we've introduced them, I want to um, have a look at these guys and their pitches. So we've got a couple so that have talked about different elements of what they do. And I just like, bear in mind that, you know, with all, all fairness to Sam, he doesn't know anything about what they do. And obviously, he's never met any of these companies, or he might have done, but doesn't remember them. He hasn't seen the pitch decks, you haven't seen the financial. So you're just going to react to what they say based on purely what you see okay yeah so that's that's the disclaimer out of the way all right so barrett's going to help us with the video here um i want to maybe start with uh let's start with some of the ones that you you didn't get let's do wikimedia Can we get those guys ronan benz on yeah. So this is a special build of the app that we prepared for yeah. the interview. It doesn't normally work unless there's a movie or a TV show playing yeah. in the background, right? So the way this works is you've got your app. Yeah, let's get that up on the screen. So, right. yeah. If you just hold it a little bit closer to this one, yeah, right. talk us through. So you've got your app, and yeah. then you turn on the TV. The movie you want to translate uh, is on the screen. Mm. You hit identify, and it will look up what the title is, okay, yeah. so it's found out what the movie is. And it shows you all the available options uh, that, in this case, are the official languages that are available for this title. Mm -hmm. So let's say you click, uh, I don't think it's gonna play without the original, uh, well, yeah. So you click on the language that you want, and then you mute the sound on the TV. 
Ah, uh, okay. So and then you plug your, in, yes, yeah, so you right. plug in the headphones. What's your oh. sort of feedback on? Because I definitely want to touch and play with it if it's if that they they have that and it's available. Uh, the most frustrating thing I will say is when founders go here let me show you a video when they have your time and it's just like no man like don't, no like don't don't you can put the video in an email follow up with it later whatever that's cool but if you have the like if you actually have the app yeah Wh- sure. what's wrong with the video is it just a waste of your time when they could explain it to you better? Well, yeah, if it's a video showing a demo of the app or something like that. Oh, like, I see. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want the yeah. live demo? You want to play yeah, it and touch yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, like if, if they if they have your time, yeah. like use it. It's better to have their personal interaction yeah. as opposed to saying, okay, so just for five minutes, I'm just going to go get a coffee and just watch, uh, watch this yeah. so you know what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's an important point, isn't it? That you should never forget that they are interacting with you yeah rather than trying to demo their product they want to kind of gauge your reaction and sort of build that rapport with you right yeah um so those guys were wikimedia did you work out what they did yeah so it's so it's like the what's it like it's, it's um oh my god i'm drawing a blank here but, but basically they can take a take a movie they can pull out the subtitles yeah so the subtitles then run on your phone to the movie i guess it's asynchronous like i mean yeah. i think that the phone i mean you could watch the movie on a laptop and have that i guess or you could have the yeah it's kind of interesting but then what do you do do you have the phone you have to have the phone in front of you to so then what are you watching you're watching the phone to read the subtitles or you're watching the tv yeah I don't know. I mean, I, how do you watch? It must you, be together. You how can't do you, be how do you how do you look at Twitter when you're when you're watching the movie too? Then, like, you can't. All right, Roland. <laughs> answer that. He wants I, to know. You're in a dialogue now. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Interesting. I, I mean, it, obviously, we didn't give him like you know enough bandwidth to answer all these questions. But I'm just interested about how that whole thing. People like do demos and so on. It's tough, isn't it, doing live demos? Yeah. Especially uh, like in a crowd or to a, an investor and so on. How to ace that? Oh, Soundhound. And that's the thing I was thinking of. It's kind of like Soundhound, right? Like Soundhound will pick up the song, that'll pick up the movie, and then yeah. it'll give you the rest of the stuff. I don't. It's it's kind of interesting. And if if the subs and dubs if they're already available, then that's pretty pretty good. I don't know. If it, I know the tech is actually quite hard to build if they're building it from scratch. So okay. I'd, I'd have to dig into that. But yeah, it's, yeah. Does does that? I mean, if somebody like pitched you that and showed you that sort of one minute at a networking event, would you be interested to talk to them more? What was the next thing you want to know about them if you did? That's probably not one for me. Just like because of the the space that it's playing and the spaces that I will want to be playing in. Um, If, but you'd clearly let them know say they yeah. are not interested in the space it's just it's just not yeah it's just not my focus area okay um well that's good because you're not you're not wasting their time either you said but maybe yeah. you speak to these guys all right i want to i want to introduce another one as well yeah. um essay jack which you said was i don't know i know it's a big market is writing essays for other people right so <laughs> all right <laughs> i know it's interesting when when we um uh, the last time we went through a whole bunch of pitch decks, one of the things you, you, you fed back to me rightly was that it would be good if some of these startups had structure to their pitch deck and maybe even looked at the Sequoia pitch deck, yeah. which, which starts, I mean, you've got the statement and then you have like slide one effectively, the problem, start with the problem. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we have people come in the studio, we like them to start with the problem and how well can they articulate the problem and understand it? So, Let's have a look at SAJ. I want you to sort of have a listen to this one and maybe, you know, maybe give your, your reaction. If somebody said, hey, look, we're SAJ and this is the problem, what do you think of their interpretation of it? I think it's important to start with the problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've identified it straight off the bat, which is students cannot write. Yeah. And, and you know what? They're, they're not alone. So we've really focused on the students can't write. Right. But many of us 
I think can't so, yeah. write. Um, right. You know, it, it's it's a quite quite a global problem. I mean, I think the statistics are something like U.S. businesses spend three point two billion dollars hmm. a year In on writing, writing remediation. remediation for people who already have jobs. Like that's writing I've, remediation. Yes. Is so that, that a thing? Yes. Oh, right. it's an expensive thing. Is okay. it like courses, like professional development? Yeah, so it's, it's where oh. you basically bring in like a consultant right, and say, yeah, yeah. oh, I'll pay you a whole bunch of money to come and teach my staff um, how, how to write, write documents. There are writing consultants, for example, in Toronto working right. with uh, junior lawyers who bill as much as the lawyers do, $400 an hour. Wow. To, to teach those lawyers what school write should have these documents. Yeah. 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 All right, so w where's the fundamental problem? And I completely agree with you because I consider myself a writer in mm -hmm some aspects of what I've done. I've written books. Mm -hmm. And I find it quite frustrating that, you know, people think they can write because they've been to university and they wrote a 10,000 word essay. Yeah. Therefore, so, so what, they teach people to write? Or they shortcut the process? So they have a platform which teaches people to write. Okay. So, yeah, you, you know, I mean, this is my understanding of it. They can do a better job of telling you if that was the case. But yeah, it, it's like giving you access to tools to help you write better which is mainly part of the teaching because actually you know, there's a lot of tools which they can claim can help you write better. Yeah. It's sort of the it's science behind the art, if you like. Yeah. How, how do you think about their articulation of the problem? I thought it was interesting. It's, it's reasonable, uh, especially with the examples. That, like I had no idea that there were people who were basically charging out the same amount as lawyers, helping lawyers to write. But it's just like... like this is, this, is, this is something I've been thinking about recently too is like writing is actually a, a really valuable skill and there are very few people who can really succinctly put their thoughts in words and to me it's really important because I'm constantly trying to write uh, just to clarify my thinking some of the times when I'm trying to when I'm writing out a thesis or when I'm writing you know the, the ideas that I'm having I just can't I can't logically make them flow and it's like okay well then this is wrong mm. okay so great like I've learned something and something else that I don't know. Um, Do you think there's a market there? I didn't really understand what, what they were selling. Tools to help you write. Who they're selling it to. Um, could be corporates, could be students. I mean, obviously, we, we only saw 30 yeah, seconds. Uh, maybe, like, maybe there's, maybe there's, there's probably a market there. Like, I, it's super frustrating for me because like, I did... I'll tell you something, actually. So... I yeah maybe I wasn't always a great great writer. I, I'd actually failed English in high school. Managed to get into law though. <laughs> uh, passed on the recount. Um, so because I just I didn't really see how it was so difficult. I didn't put much time and effort into the exam because it, what it was doing is just like you know you're regurgitating essays that you spend all year trying to cre you know create a craft or whatever. Um, so I kind of did the the bare minimum there. I actually spent a lot of time playing tennis in that English class, and then yeah, then, then I managed to actually get through law. But then in law, I mean, we were writing, we we're writing essays all the time. I was surprised when we compared like what, what we were doing at my law school versus the the other law schools in New Zealand. They a lot of the a lot of them would only have to write one two essays to get to the end of their degree. For us, it was a couple every paper every semester it was just like constant and while i didn't like it at the time i think it taught a really good discipline and now it's a, a, a hell of a lot easier to be able to write so yeah i think it's i think there's there's probably a market there for the people that haven't been able to have that experience and and take the time to do that but at the same time it's like it's one of these it's one of those skills that people aren't going to really pick up or improve on unless they they really do want to improve themselves mm. so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. There's probably market. I've got no idea what they go to market as. Or when you, you you know, I mean, you told a personal story about your writing, for example. When when somebody explains a problem to you in like a pitch, ha, do I mean, there's a lot of focus, for example, on like, you know, scratching your own itch and personal pain points and personal stories. Is, does that is that always necessary, or is it just like here's the problem? There are people who can't write. Th those guys are, were actually university professors, so they come from that world, so they uh, see that, right? Yeah. So they, yeah, they've seen... Yeah, okay, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's with it's, a bit so, more bandwidth, they could have told that story, right? Yeah, um, but if, if... Okay, so actually some, some, relative, some relevant feedback there is if they were going to present that problem, it would be far easier to say, like, this this is the... This is the... the, the how uh, you say this, this is the example you know the, 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 this is the target client and this is yeah. the problem that they have 
and this is how we're solving it because there was like there was a lot of waffle it was interesting around the facts that they put in there but i kind of just wanted to know but like what does the product really look like and who have they created that for because like on the problem statement what i'm generally looking for is something that uh, resonates with me something that probably it's probably something that i've thought about before or something that i can easily grok onto the I, th- I think entrepreneurs get themselves into a problem when they are tr- really trying to get an investor to understand the problem and, and get them on board because then they have just such a long educational journey ahead of them right. to get them up to speed with the product. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, with all fairness to those guys, they only had 30 seconds to explain. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. the whole... The, yeah, I, you know, do you think, that, for example, if an investor's not in on, on the problem, then... It, is the deal can even just go ahead do you think it's lost at that point if, if you if if the investor doesn't get the problem that you're trying to solve I mean, it's got to be such a low probability i don't know no right. idea our numbers on this but it's got to be such a low probability if they don't get it the first time yeah and then they come around unless they have something other something extraneous that happens to them and then they go oh yeah okay now now i understand why that's important right yeah, because maybe they hadn't seen that problem before, but now you yeah. need to do some data. Like in the the section Twitter book, there was a uh, Fred Ocean, the one of the the the, the, v, the VCs there. He heard about the pitch, didn't like it, didn't care. Went away on a fishing trip. His son was all over Twitter. He was like, "Yeah, okay, I got to actually look into this in more detail." Right, right. And and got involved. So yeah, yeah. okay, there's some other external event there that happened. Anyone to get involved? Otherwise, it's I think it's really hard. Yeah, when when somebody's pitched you a problem, how have you sort of any of them sort of stuck with you like you know is there great ways of doing that is there a sort of a really effective way of doing that because i i don't think it's ne- always necessary and sometimes it can be overdone like i think storytelling is a great way of doing it however sometimes like when i watch ted talks i wish they just say yeah, yeah. just just tell me what it does <laughs> rather than like okay i don't yeah. need like the like okay i was five years old working on a farm in africa i don't need all that right because it's like it's, it becomes formulaic it's easier to do one-on-one as opposed to if you're doing it with a crowd because i like i like okay this is what it is and if i want to know more about that i'll ask questions we'll dig down to it and we can have a conversation about that and then give me the story okay then i want to know like the full mm. story but if it's if you're presenting to a crowd then that's that's way more difficult, right? What do you put across? Do you put across the full uh, story? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I think you can if you're a really good storyteller and you can get to the point relatively quickly, but I'd still like to you know, kind of use the pyramid principle and actually ha- yeah. have, have, have some kind of guidance as to what you're going to get to and then build it out from there. If, if a startup founder has like, identifies a problem but it has no sort of personal connection with it, how does that sort of resonate with you? Is that an, is that an issue? For example, you said, look, you know, maybe I've worked in finance and I understand there's this problem with, you know, like, you know, people's attitudes towards saving, for example. But, you know, it's just like they've identified a problem, but they don't have anything personally attached to it. How does that work with you? Is that an issue at all? Because I know some people say that they want to see some of the personal investment in that problem, like it's affected yeah. you. Or but then you're going to get, uh, you're going to get guys who are doing more social impact companies, right? Like, uh, so that. Uh, they might be creating solar batteries, solar panel solar batteries uh, that they're putting on roofs in Burma. Um, they're not living in Burma, but that could, you know, that's still a very relevant problem that they're solving. You know, the, the, the grid doesn't extend out to all of the, the places there. Would that not, so, that's not a showstopper for you? No. Nah. They've never lived there or? I, th- I, th- I think the thing, the thing that's most important though is that they have, they, they, they do have some kind of, I suppose, expertise network that what I'm, what I'm always looking for those is, is like why then why now yeah this is something i always ask myself as, as well like why me why now but like why then why now and do they have some kind of compelling unfair advantage yeah, yeah. that allows them to do this because somebody else could come along and say like i'm gonna yeah. do this right and okay this guy actually lives in burma and he speaks about yeah. me etc etc right yeah because then you have to work out whether or not that can his uncles in the government right yeah <laughs> check we yeah. do, we're in okay cool um I want to do the reset one because I think you identified that one and have a look mm. at it. And I think, you know, it's how do you, uh, and we're not going to talk necessarily about the um, product itself, but how founders validate products. And then when they talk to you, how that sort of works with you in the sense that you're, you're hearing somebody talk about something that they built, but you're looking for some kind of, val- how have you validated this thing, right? Yeah. So, um, 
So this is Shen, Shen Xiaoying. She's just going to talk about her story and how she's gone out and validated. I just want to hear your sort of reaction to this kind of a founder. Is it a role? I I think the idea when it first came out was quite different. So I went to actually all my friends, uh, mostly in the legal industry, but some are in I would say in the investment startup world, and to ask for their opinion about the concept of reset.、Mm. And I did get a lot of、uh, feedback, especially on the positioning, because initially it was really about. Uh, divorce and、mm. the pain,、mm. and how do you resolve the conflict? So、uh, positioning is one thing. How do you promote this uh, application? Uh, how is it going to sit well with the public、um, policy? And also in in this part of the world, it's still quite a, an issue to talk about、mm. it openly and promote it openly. And then also about the market. How big is the divorce market? Even though the trend is rising. How how big is the market in terms of actual people who will use this service, right? And compared to, of course, the offline lawyers and、mm. what they are doing, so that has kind so of. So reset. I mean, obviously, she can do a better job of it. So reset is focus was in focus initially on divorce and like mindfulness and the fact of like mental health and divorce, and、mm. particularly like helping lawyers, and and working with their clients. So that's sort of where it started. It's sort of evolved from that to be more about mental health generally. Yeah, it makes more sense because it's just a way big market. If somebody、yeah. comes to you and says,、uh, you know, this is related to divorce, and it's not an extra exciting subject, obviously it's a it's a subject where there's money because you involve lawyers, but not、yeah. necessarily a high growth industry. How, how does that sort of work with you? And when you sort of hear that sort of whole hustle about going out and talking to people about it.、Um, Well, this one's this one's a bit easier one though to get a little bit of traction on as well because then they can they can actually put it out to users. So, like going and saying, I I talk to my friends, I talk to lawyers. It's like okay, like yeah, mental health is an issue. I go, we we think I think I think you can intuitively just agree that people are going to be going through mental anguish if they're going through divorce. So, getting some kind of external feedback on that, I I, I don't care. Like,、hmm. it, it it it's it's fair enough.、Uh, but I think what is more interesting in that situation is like why is the solution novel. And and how are they actually pushing that out to the right people?、Mm. Uh, that's that's something I wasn't that that clear with. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's it reminds me of that sort of Peter Thiel question. He says like, "What do most people disagree with you on? What's that fundamental truth?" Because you know m- maybe everybody agrees that mental health is an issue. Nobody's saying that's not an issue, and yet people say like all that sort of negativity related with divorce is an issue. Yet, what are you doing differently? Do, do you? I mean. I I was wondering when he asked that question. I can understand that he's asking that because he's looking for that unicorn or that huge hit. Yeah. Because obviously he has the resources to be involved in those kind of investments. Do all? Wait, are you looking for, or is it a necessary part when you sit with an investment or hear a pitch that they're thinking differently about the problem to everybody else? Maybe they just have really good execution. Maybe they say, "Yeah, this is mental health." We're going to deal with it because we just have really good execution. Or are you looking for somebody who said, "Look, everybody thinks it's like this." I'm looking for the guy who's got the bit of the crazy idea that people are, you know, is getting yeah, turned down. Yeah, I think everyone, everyone would like to say that that's what they're going after too. But then you meet the crazy guy, and everyone's like, "Nah, I'm out." So it's if you were to look at it on a matrix, it's like you want to be non-consensus and right, right? You, and to do that, you have to be willing to be wrong for. Certain periods of time, you as an investor or the startup founder, both,、okay. right? Like you, like is 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 you you both. You're gonna be sometimes you're gonna be probably wrong on the idea and and wrong on the people. Sometimes you're just gonna be wrong. Like the 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 con, you're gonna feel like the investment is going nowhere. It's gonna feel like it was wrong for a period of time until other people caught onto it, and that's kind of the ideal, right? Because then, yes, you're in the right space, but it's it's taking time for everyone else to catch up and and switch onto your way of thinking. So that's the ideal that you're aiming for, but then in reality, being able to get to those situations is, is very difficult too. Because I think if you, if, if you were to go and have a look at what the startup startup ecosystem over in the valley looks like generally, I mean, most of those guys、uh, have come through kind of like Ivy League undergrad to post grad, and then they go out and they start a startup. And like, you know, holy shit, that's 
it's crazy. Like they're going to have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt, and then they're able to go out there and live for themselves for a while. Like th- those those kind of people generally aren't going to be non consensus. Mm. Uh, over here, I think I think you probably find that it's somewhat similar. The people who come from certain schools have certain backgrounds it, it is definitely going to be easier for them to do things in life uh, so they're going to be perceived as more successful they're going to be the ones that typical vcs are going to want to fund more so so getting the getting the weird guys coming up from some unusual background like most people are going to run a mile this is a really interesting point because we talked about this in the last time that we were on air about that the most the best ideas come disguised as bad ideas yeah so that how do you deal with that because it's like you know it, we, we, i could show you all these different pictures and you might think nuts oh it's a good idea it's a good idea this guy is crazy look at the way he's dressed like he speaks funny he looks funny you know he doesn't come from stanford all that kind of stuff. So the natural sort of like signals are putting you off, right? Unless you've sort of honed in on that. How do you deal with that? I mean, you know, that this must be the challenge of being an investor. People think yeah. it's just like doing the, the numbers, isn't it? But you're looking for something. How, how do you sort of identify that? Like, you know, if you sat with these pictures. Yeah, this is, this is the touch and feel aspect, right? That we talked about before. It's like, I'll know it when I say it. Right. But then do I really know it? I don't know. Like this it's I Is it a gut I have thing? A, yeah, I have a feeling about oh. what I'm looking for generally. And also the the people that you're looking at, maybe they're they're really strong in some areas and really weak in other ones. And so that's that could be a signal, right? Like they they're great, they're great with product, they're great with the tech side of things, love solving problems, horrible for people. They're completely autistic, right? Like cannot hold a conversation together. Okay, like may- maybe that's actually a good thing because if they can get the other right founders on that can right. complement the, 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 the skill sets where they're lacking, that's a pretty powerful combination. And then, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Have you, have you met a, a, a founder that was one of those weirdos <laughs> with all due respect? Because I think a lot of them are kind of strange, but you sort of saw yeah, something. Yeah, there was one. There was one. I was definitely like, oh, this guy's a little bit unusual, but I'll have a call anyway. Did you invest in them? No, I didn't completely. I, I didn't. I didn't believe in the kind of problem solution statement he was putting out there. Right. Uh, but I like full credit to him uh, because he. Had, I think he dropped out of high school. He was. He was definitely a little bit eccentric, but he was like. Um, I gave him a bit of feedback after the call, and he said, "Oh yeah, well, I'm going to do this anyway." And I think he's he was still cracking along. Is like, I. I, I was just like I was impressed. I was impressed by his hustle, the way that he was going about things. When he could have taken the complete opposite perspective and been like, right. "Oh, life's unfair. I haven't been given these same opportunities as other people." Da da da. And I'm 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 pretty confident that that guy, maybe not on this idea, but on one of the ideas, he will crack it if he can kind of keep keep at it and, and build a bit of structure in there. Um, That's tough though, isn't it? Because you're yeah, it, it could go either way. Yeah, he could end up like you say, and just you know because he, he, he receives constant rejection for that kind of yeah. behavior, it then might in some way limit him with access to the resources that he needs to make that happen, right? Yeah, this, this is why some of the best uh, entrepreneurs have got to be just eternal optimists. Yeah. And just always see the positive. And he, uh, he, he, he seemed like he had the right kind of personality. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm always keeping this... Uh, contra portfolio right like all the, uh, yeah. the things that i see and i don't invest in the reason i don't invest in them and kind of returning to that from time to time like okay is that how is that one gone why is that one going well should i have should i have changed the way that i made the decision then because is that an actual portfolio which only you see which you say these are the ones i didn't do these are the ones yeah. i didn't take a call on and you actually keep a log on them yeah and go back to it and obviously your actual portfolio is outperforming the anti-portfolio right Oh, well, I don't know because a lot of this stuff's private, right? So I don't know what the you know, valuation subsequent oh, rounds are looking like right. too and also, right, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. But that's that's the idea anyway at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> okay. like if, if there's I'll... some that come through, become unicorns, okay, like, great. That's awesome for them. But then you know, I'll, I'll learn something from it as well. Yeah. Least. What have you learned from looking at the anti-port, the contra portfolio as you call it and actually going back and having a look at it? 
do you actually sort of log as well your interactions and say the reasons why you didn't invest in this company like a journal oh not so much not that much detail no. but you just kind of keep them on file yeah I, like i'm still i'm still learning things through the process and it's There haven't been there haven't been any situations that have occurred so far, and this is probably just because I've only been doing this for a couple of years, where I've been like I massively made a, a wrong decision because I was using the wrong metrics, the wrong right, mindset, right. the wrong framework. Oh, you know, I just wasn't looking at it the right way. Um, some of these, you know, it's, it's it's very inductionist too. You know, some of these companies they they. It's a very easy liquidity environment, so they could be like the Thanksgiving Day turkey, and that everything's going really, really, really well until it's not. And I don't know that yet. And yeah, I've probably yeah. got some of those in the portfolio too, and I don't know that yet. So I have to, yeah. I just, I just, I, I'm constantly aware that there's there's blind spots in my process, and I'm trying to fix them. What do you think? I mean, if we were to sit here a year from now, what do you think you would have liked to have improved as a VC about what you do? that you're still sort of learning about that you know what are the areas do you think that I'd really like to get better at that other than being able to add, like add value through some kind of like formal process it's actually just to, to to have more of a network to be able to reach out and make the connections to the companies in the industry, regardless of not, uh, regardless of whether I'm investing or not, and 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 building out on that aspect, I think that that would be the biggest area for me that that I'd want to want to improve on. Yeah, but you, you actually, I think this is the, you know, where we started the the conversation today. You you actually enjoy that. That's not for you a yeah. cost, is it? You know, that's the, I think for a traditional VC, not they're not all the same, but the the image is, is that part of the 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 job is a cost part you know you talked about service yeah. right it's almost like that's their cost yeah thing. and depends like so this is again like what, what's your personality like and I'm, i guess I'd, I'd classify myself as more like an extrovert or introvert i like talking with people until i don't and then i've just got to lock myself away in a room for you know, a couple of hours a couple of days and recharge so yeah, yeah I, I i do like to get out there and i don't like i don't view these things as zero sum i don't care to connect other people i don't I don't think like, oh, okay, maybe they're going to have a better opportunity. Um, and this, I, I don't really suffer from the FOMO as much. Yeah, I that's think, a key point. I think it's, you know, there's, there's always another bus coming around the corner. So it's, I think it's easier for me to be able to let some of these things go. Also, like, I mean, coming from a background in finance too, you know, I've, I've been aware of the psychological biases for a long time. And I, I I've tried to create ways to deal with them. Some of them I think I've dealt with a little bit too well, and that. Um, what do you mean, like like FOMO, for example? Because oh, that that is well, definitely a thing for both startup founders and investors. Certainly, it's a it's a fear that they can play on to get investors to pile into a deal, and yet at the same time, I think investors. Just, yeah, it's just make being wrong just decisions. being just being aware of some of my biases, and sometimes I'll overcorrect. Right. S which. Yeah, I, I think that that could have cost me. Right. Because in, yeah, I'm just very strong-willed. So if I if I know that, okay, my personality is trying to edge me towards this way and I'm like, no, no, this is what I, sh this is what I should be doing and I have some kind of framework that suggests that this is the way that it should be. It's like, no, I will not let my gut overrule me this time. And some of those times there's a reason for that gut feel and I, I, and, and I don't go, for, go with it. I mean, that's... That's 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 probably one of the issues with the biases. But I think a lot of the like a lot of the younger angels that are, that are getting into the scene too, they're just unaware of the, those biases. Like, yeah, yeah. They just want to jump on with every, everyone else, and to get those really great opportunities, you've got to be uh, willing to do the uncomfortable things at the right time. Yeah, and, and team up with other people as well to yeah. kind of watch out for those blind spots. Um, uh, yeah, and this has been a really interesting conversation. I think you know, as, as I've got to know you as well over these conversations and our offline conversations as well, is that. You know, one of the things I'm always impressed with you, Sam, is that and I think anybody that gets this from spending time with you, you're super disciplined. Like mm. you, you don't drink coffee, obviously. That's a thing, and that that's no small thing either. Um, you run like ultra marathons up in Used the Himalayas. To. I did once. 
once. I mean, yeah. but once is enough, right? Uh, you weren't running in the death zone or anything, but still, you were up there running. That's enough. Ultra, what, 50K, 60K? 60. 60K. And um, I yeah. think the the point, the, the point. I mean, obviously, I'm impressed by something like that. I do Ironman myself. It, it, the point is, is that can come across as a little bit intimidating to a founder as well, especially if that, that comes on the other side of money. Do you know what I mean? It's like that... That. That's why I, I got the smile though, right? Well, no, exactly. I mean, like, that. that's the point is like, I think you're like a funny guy and you're like super friendly and you want to help people, right? And that is not the traditional view of an investor, right? And especially like in that sort of initial reaction, uh, interaction, you can be quite sort of direct. Yeah. And with a founder. But I think that's why, that's why I called you the Simon Cowell of... Yeah. the VC world and I think it's because you, you win respect at the end of the day it's not like you're doing it out of whim like you know I'm going to reject you because I've had a bad day or that kind of thing you're doing yeah. it with, like well, it's, it's also like this is what I get really frustrated about is like uh, I think a lot of people in finance they just take themselves way too seriously and they view themselves as like the, the these gatekeepers for their capital and realistically it's the entrepreneurs that are out there they're risking everything and they're the ones who are creating the value at the end of the day and you you you, you owe something to them Man. right yeah, I like the way you put it, and it's, it's refreshing to hear that. Hey, so listen, this is um, the first in a series of investor shows. I'm going to put you on the spot. Who do we want to see in this studio? I mean, we've got some names like Joseph McCullough is going to join us. M- M- Michael Crow will come as well and join us in. Let's put a call out. Who? What kind of people do you think, if the 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 net result is that we want to help educate the startup ecosystem? And encourage people to, you know, connect with, you know, both sides of the table, right? What kind of people do we need to see in here? And you can name names as well, by the way, yeah. so we can tag them. But who do you think? What kind of people? Was it more? I think anyone, who, anyone who's got a, got an opinion, who, uh, and, and feels like they actually have a different perspective on things, but uh, because I think generally in Asia, the views are just homogenized. Uh, you look at a lot of the investment firms and they, they especially in Singapore and they all kind of stem from one location. So yeah, any, anyone who's who's out there that's doing something different that wants to kind of tell their story or just Are there wants, to, wants to rip pieces into me. So it's, it's, yeah. You enjoy the challenge. Yeah, yeah it would be good, good to have a bit of spar. I, yeah, I think it would be interesting. Definitely. I would love that. And do you think there's enough VCs out there doing enough that's different, like have opinions or, you know, most of them are quite, I mean, they turn up at conferences and so on, but there's not enough actually publishing stuff like you or doing podcasts. I mean, there are. Yeah, the this is the thing. This is the thing. I don't know. Where are they? But I think I'm sure there are some and I'm sure they, they do have opinions. And maybe it's just because they haven't had the platform before to be able to felt like they had the platform to be able to do that. So if there's, yeah, if there's others out there that, that, that want to, that'd be great. Come. No, the challenge is, is, is out there. You set, we've we've uh, put the challenge out there. If you are in that space, if you have you know a, a different view on how things are, then we'd love to hear it and uh, create that platform as well. And I think hopefully startup founders can get a lot out of this as well. They can sort of listen and understand. A, I mean, just like the, the sort of small clips that we shared, what kind of, you know, almost just I think the basic starting point is to understand it from the other side of the table. You know, like how do they think? how does an investor view what I do? Because I, I think people don't look at it from that perspective. Like you have an idea about something or you think like this. That sort of empathy, I think, goes a long way. Yeah. Um, Sam, thank you so much. And, you know, thanks for agreeing to be a good sport and getting this started. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's good. Let's, let's do more of this and let's get some people who can kind of maybe challenge you a little bit, hold you to task. Yeah, just... Just difference of opinion. I mean, just anything anything that that, that that would be challenging, I think would be great. Excellent. What's the best way to reach out to you? How, how do you like people contacting you and sort of what sort of context? And oh, ping me on the email. Email? Yeah. Yeah. We'll put all the details in the show notes. And you, yep. you're happy to people just ping you pitch decks? I know yeah. You might, you, I get through most of them. I'm zero inbox. Really? Yeah. I, you're super disciplined. I you like get up at three in the morning and just like knock out what you're Don't emails. get up at three in the morning. I make sure I get a good night's sleep. That's <laughs> something I, I do make sure because I used to cut sleep because it's an easier thing to cut out. And it's it's actually, okay, if you want a book, if you want a book that's meaningful, yeah, the one on sleep. Because then I was like, yep, okay, this this makes a lot of sense. Joseph's really, been talking about that. Yeah, I, th- I just think it's... Massive. What was this book? He said to me, so Joseph McCarner, who is here, and uh, he's a 
um, healthcare investor. He said like a health tech investor. So he's like, yeah, this book on sleep I've been reading. He just every time I meet Joseph, he tells me about this book and sleep. What's what? Is, what am I missing? Oh, we'll put, we'll put the title on the show notes. So, but uh, just how much it impacts your like your thinking, your body. Just uh, I, and I don't have the the facts at the top of my head, but yeah, it's it's massive. Like any time I've got a massive amount of issues, I just sleep more and right. things seem to kind of calm down and then I have the capacity to be able to deal with what I need to deal with. So it it, it, it works. Uh, there you go. All right, people. There, there's, a, there's a throwaway tip for you. Sleep a bit more. But anyway, we'll be back next time. And I think what we do for the next one as well, um, we will uh, maybe put the call out and start getting people to write in, write in, to text in all that stuff with their their questions about the kind of subjects we'll we'll have a theme on a weekly basis do you think we could base it around a theme like specific areas of vc that bring in some guests to talk about those as well yeah industries yeah cool all right we're signing out this is graham brown and sam kibb we're in the pitch media razor studio thank you so much thanks come at me 